So good evening. We would like to welcome you to our FAUNA webinar on barn safety presented by Dr. Rebecca Gimenez Houston. This program is being brought to you by the FAUNA Health Committee. I'm Joe Clough, and with me this evening is Emily Jewell and Julie Karpis. We are members of FAUNA's Health Committee. I would also like to thank Jason Tice and Jessica Tice for their technical assistance this evening. We are recording this webinar and plan to have it posted in our library in a couple of days. And it should also be noted that we are broadcasting live on Facebook this evening. We have a large audience with us tonight and everyone will be on listen only mode. We will stop periodically throughout the presentation to allow you to ask Rebecca questions. To submit your questions, you can use Q&A at the bottom screen toolbar. If you're on Facebook, put your questions in the comment sections and we will try to get them answered. We would now like to welcome back our presenter, Rebecca. Many of you will remember her from her important fauna presentation and magazine article on trailer safety. Now a bit about her. She's got an impressive resume. I'll tell you that. She is a volunteer firefighter, a public information officer, and a fire prevention instructor for the city of Gray, Georgia. Rebecca does research and developmental work with several vet schools and other institutions. She provides education and training on heavy rescue of large animals. An internationally sought after speaker and instructor, she edited and wrote the only textbook available to fire services and vets on technical rescue of large animals and several chapters and major veterinary books on similar subjects. She contributes her time and expertise to several international committees on equine welfare and is the NFPA Standard 150 Technical Chair and Subject Matter Expert. Rebecca holds a BS from Wilford College and a PhD from Clemson University and her current research interests include a national survey on trailer accident causality, horse barn fire causality, and a physiologic responses to technical rescue procedures and equipment in large animals. She's a former logistic officer for FEMA's veterinary medical assistance team, a decorated combat veteran and a major in the US Army Reserves. Thank you for your service, Rebecca. She's active in various organizations related to disaster preparedness and equine welfare. She provides training worldwide in technical large animal emergency rescue techniques and methodology and equine cruelty investigations. Rebecca has published numerous critiques and innovative journal articles on a wide variety of subjects related to equine heavy rescue and welfare, including for our fauna. We are truly fortunate to have a distinguished speaker this evening. Welcome, Rebecca. We are so pleased you are back and with us this evening to discuss this very important topic with our members. And at this time, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me well? We can. Yes. Fantastic. So thank you for that introduction. I'm so glad to be here because you guys are doing a great job of getting a lot of information out to your members. And uh, there's, there's a lot of organizations that don't take the time to do that. So I greatly appreciate it. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. And let's see, why am I having problems going up and down? Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? There we go. I don't know what I did different. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, um, it happens everywhere, we're going to talk about some of the learning tools um, that we can learn from looking at other examples. And as Joanne was pointing out, there was a big fire yesterday in uh, Montana. So it happens all the time. We're going to talk about the welfare disaster that our barns really are and why we've got to, we got to change some of the things that we do that it will limit the exposure of horses to these kinds of situations. Uh, some simple improvements to almost every single barn, educating people, doing some practice evacuations, which is harder than you think. Um, what would the perfect barn, if I built it, what would it look like? And then how to get your local fire department involved. So I'm going to send you guys home with some homework. 
So you guys know about the Frisians of Majesty Farm barn fire. It was an arson barn fire, and the person that uh, was involved died of smoke inhalation. Uh, they actually managed to get the horses out of that one. Um, so that's a huge success story. But it reminds us that even within your breed, it does happen. Um, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter if you've got fancy horses or simple horses or just a little horse farm, it happens. And so what I did was I just looked around in Georgia and I said, hey, over the last 10 years and some of these big fires, how many horses have we lost? We've lost almost 200 horses just in Georgia over the last 10 years in big loss fires. And I'm going to remind you that if um, you lose one or two horses, it usually doesn't make it to the internet. It doesn't make it to, to the media. Uh, so it doesn't get really, really reported. So we have no idea how many of these animals are actually being lost every single year. That's a lot of horses. And um, some of those horses are very valuable and show horses, performance horses. Some of those horses are just someone's beloved pet. But uh, all of those horses, that's too many losses. So it happens everywhere. If you start looking around in your state, you'd find the same thing. But part of our challenge is it's a fundamental thing. We are putting animals into a cage and we're leaving them for hopefully less than 12 hours a day, but 12 to 18 hours a day in some cases. And unlike you, when you go to a motel, you have the real escape plan. It's on the back of the door. They have all the things in that motel or hotel to get you out if there's a fire or an emergency. But that is not true for horses. So they're in there. They have no escape plan. They have no idea what to do. They have no ability to do that. And they only have one exit, usually to the interior aisle, which is where the fire department is not going to let you go to try to save your horses. And then of course, if you look at this picture, you also have some you know, really great engineering here, a crappy box fan with uh, stuck over here on, an, on a, you know, it's really funny, those extension cords, people don't realize you're supposed to be standing there watching it. An extension cord is not to be used unless it's supervised by a human being and people don't realize it. And then take a look at this barn. Um, doesn't look like to me that, that there's much headroom in that barn and it's basically just a dark, dank cage. So we got to change some of those kind of things for welfare reasons as for the, the horses, if nothing else. I'm not going to run this entire thing for two minutes, but I am going to run it. Can you guys nod your heads if you can see the video? These firefighters are attempting to catch and lead horses in a <laughs> fake barn. We... We smoked this up so that you really can't see unless you have an infrared camera. And they are trying to figure out how to catch a horse. Now these horses are very good horses. These are girlfriend of mine's horses and they're broke to death, handled by all kinds of people. And they've heard about Darth Vader. They've never seen Darth Vader, but Darth Vader just walked down the barn aisle. He breathes like an animal, has never heard before. He's doing all the right things. He's trying to pet her, but he's breathing like this. And every once in a while he has to move because if he doesn't move, the pass alarm, which is for his safety, is going to go off and it's a really loud thing. So if you take a look at the horse's ears and its body language, you already saw him step away from the guy. And this is a calm, sweet horse. Now I want you to notice that there is 47 wrong ways to put a halter on a horse. And a firefighter that's never done it before can find every single one of those 47 wrong ways. It's not their fault. They've never done it before. So that's what I really want you guys to understand. Even if the fire department gets there, they have no expertise in horses. And so we in our barns have to come up with a plan before the fire department gets there. And of course, some of the data really shows that the fire department probably isn't going to get there in time anyway. You can see how frustrated this guy is. He's trying to do the best he can with what he's got. He finally gave up on the halter because he realized, A, he doesn't know how to put it on, and B, it's really difficult to do when you have your gloves on. So anyway, it gives you a point. So first of all, I want to convince you it happens everywhere. It happens at well-run facilities. It happens at backyard barns. It doesn't matter. This happens to be one a couple years ago in Missouri. Beautiful facility. And there's the same facility. Um, they lost uh, 10 horses, but they rescued 15. These are the kinds of things that I research because I want to know if you lost 10, but you saved 15, what did you do right? 
there obviously was something wrong, but you did something right. So we start looking around and I go back to the internet. I look at people's Facebook pages. I look at their websites and I start looking for these things. And this is pictures before the fire of some of the things that they were doing. Yes, they have the box fans, um, but they had paddocks for choice on one side of the barn. And guess what? The horses they saved had paddocks with a choice to the salts. Now, they do have a really long distance to egress. Now, some of you on this call may be younger than me, and maybe you can run real fast, but the older you get, the harder it is for me to run 50 feet or 100 feet. And so we always try to shorten that egress to an exit for us as well as for animals. I don't see any fire extinguishers in these pictures. They may have had them, but I don't see them. Um, and I don't see any evidence of a smoke detector or alarm system, and there's some uncovered lights. Why is that important? Because the way we build barns is based on what horse people do, not what fire protection engineers and firefighters would like to see. But let's go to another facility. This happens to be a recent loss in Colorado and beautiful facility. I mean, everybody loves something like this, but some of the first things I notice is this is the entrance, this big fancy entrance, and it looks like a stall door and it looks like another stall door. So that's one of the first things is where's the people entrances and where's the horse entrances, right? So I see a lot of combustibles and I see some paddocks for choice on some of these. Um, it does look like, and I will tell you straight, you know, full disclosure, I am a function is more important than pretty kind of person. There's some people that are more function, they're not as worried about the function as the pretty. Um, but I will tell you that sometimes gets you in trouble. I don't see any fire extinguishers, no smart detection or alarm system. So let's go further into this facility. Uh, again, I pulled these from the website or their Facebook page. Um, beautiful, you know, a lot of people would look at this and say, wow, that's awesome. And I say, wow, that's a cage with no exit. Oh, wait, it does have an exit on the outside. That's awesome. Wait, is that, a, is that an actual exit? Um, or can you unlock it from the inside and from the outside. That's some of the problems with these exits to the outside. Sometimes you can't unlock it from the outside. You have to be on the inside to do so. Turns out that's what happened in some of these, these situations. And so there's our horse looking out and you know it's a beautiful picture, but the point is, are we going to actually be able to remove this horse in this kind of a situation, right? So that comes down to a serious welfare issue. Um, some of the situations that we consider normal in our industry are not considered best practice if you talk to behaviorists, if you talk to veterinarians, um, and if you talk to fire protection engineers, they will tell you horses should have a choice and a way out because we aren't sitting there 24-7 being able to open the stall door and lead them out if they're in a fire. Um, I want you to think about that analogy of a hotel. You know, we use our brains and we can read the you know, exit plan and we know how to get to the stairs on the end of the building and we know how to stay away from the elevators, but horses don't do those things. And so we are trying to get better about doing small things like this, you know, stall door to the inside, stall door to the outside, better ventilation, gives secondary door to the outside wall, also gives the animal a choice. And then of course, if you do have to have the door shut for some reason, make sure that it's accessible from both sides because that's very frustrating to, to anybody that comes to a barn fire and has a chance to perhaps save an animal and they can't get in. Um, same facility, beautiful. You know, everybody looks at that and, and we all go, wow, that's beautiful. I'd love to have that. But I also say, you know, what about where's the fire extinguishers? There should be a fire extinguisher right there. If you are going to actually do something about a barn fire, you've got to have a fire extinguisher. And I don't see any evidence of the smoke detection or alarm system. Again, the, the actual final report hasn't come out on this one yet, but um, we take a look at this. And this is their riding arena, which is unfortunately connected to the barn, which is again, not a best practice. Um, and if it had been at least 50 feet away, we might have saved that part at least. Um, but unfortunately they ended up losing everything. I see lots of combustibles, everything's made out of wood, huge spaces, which gives you lots of ventilation. There's nothing you can do about that in barns. There's long distance to the egress. Um, 
no fire extinguishers, uncovered lights, those kind of things. And that really comes down to getting your local fire department to come out and look at your facility and say, hey, they will see it in a very different light. And that's part of your homework. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So some of the problems is that barns are usually made out of wood frame. Some people have metal and that's okay. The problem is whether it's metal or it's wood frame, when heat rises and gets caught in the underneath the roof structure, um, what happens is it starts to build heat. And at that point, the metal gusset plates, which are these little things right here in the pictures that are putting these joists together with the rafters, those will fail when they get to a certain temperature. And if you have wood or you have metal, it doesn't really matter. Uh, metal deforms at the same temperature that wood starts to catch on fire. So either way, it's not a safe place for a person or for a horse. So that's the fundamental challenge and why we don't want people running down the, the barn aisle, because when these things fail, the truss fails, the joist fails, the, the rafters fall, and then it falls into the interior aisle. And then of course, blogs your exit and starts a fire right where you are, or maybe kills you if it lands on your head. So we don't want those things to happen. So this is the fire. Um, there was a hero, this guy, um, his name is Hebierto Soto Sanchez. And apparently he was able to get four horses out. Um, sadly, he ended up with smoke inhalation and he survived it. But, you know, this was a big deal and uh, very, 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 you know, success because they got the four out. Good for them. Sadly, they lost another 10. So what did it look like? I guarantee you I haven't been able, you know, they haven't made me privy to the report yet. But I guarantee you that this ATV or whatever that thing is right there is probably what Javierto rode in when he saw the fire. It probably started somewhere down here and electrical probably because most barn fires are electrical he probably rode in on this and tried to get some of the horses out you can see that there are open doors right here it looks like some of these stalls are open so perhaps he was able to get horses from the outside wall and get them out of there um, we don't know yet so all doors to the paddocks are important um, rural response times how long it takes your fire department i want you guys to call your local fire department tomorrow and say hey this is my address what is the average response time in my community and they will tell you and it's probably going to be a very sobering thing for you because when you realize how long it actually takes them to get to your place as far as their response times if you live in a city it's going to be short if you live in a rural area it's going to be longer and what that really puts it on is the honest is on you to come up with a plan. Um, if you look at these pictures, what a firefighter sees is this entire space is already on fire. There was nothing to save at this point. There's nothing that can survive flames and, and smoke like that. And it's really not the, the flames, it's the smoke, right? Um, probably no smoke detection or alarm system. I don't know how this guy was alerted that this happened. But you see that the barn is here and that's the arena and it's already transferred over the arena. So this has been burning for a while. And this is the cop, this is the first person on scene. So what that tells you is if he's the first person on scene taking photos, then there was no way that the fire department was gonna be able to save much, right? That's not a ding on the fire department. They're doing the best they can. And most rural fire departments are volunteers. So they're similar to me. I'm a volunteer firefighter. If I get a call out right now, I'm doing this webinar, so I can't go. <laughs> But if I w found out that there was a fire, normally what I would have to do is pick up my keys, get my phone, get my radio, um, walk out the door, crank the truck, make sure that I know where the address is, and we're going to the fire department. My fire department is seven miles away. It takes me at least seven minutes to get there. And then I get in the truck and drive to whatever the location is. You can see that that's um, probably not a going to make for a really fast response time. And, you know, more and more, part, it's just pictures of fire. There's nothing to save. Everything in that, fi in that fire that was in that space is, is lost. And the fire department at this point is finally pulling some hose. We call that TV water because it looks great. And what they're really trying to do is just cool the fire down so, and protect exposure so that it doesn't go somewhere else or start a wildfire um, somewhere else. But it's TV water. It looks great on TV, but it really isn't doing much at this point. So let's take a look at their facility just a little bit and say, hey, you know, what do I see? What am I, what can I learn from this? 
first of all, how do I get in the gate? If you have a fancy gate, how does the fire department get there? Um, I don't see a reflective ad address sign. This was a fire that happened at night. You're driving along in a fire department vehicle. Everybody uses Google. How many times have you used a Google address and it wasn't exactly where it's supposed to be? Or you're driving down the road and as you pass this, you finally realize, oh, that's the place. So now you have to back up a fire truck. That's, that's not a lot of fun. So other things I do see is good secondary fencing. Um, an excellent access base, in other words, that's either uh, gravel or it's asphalt or it's concrete. Those three things are the things that fire departments like to drive on. They do not like to drive on mud or dirt or clay. They want a good access base because their vehicles weigh about 40,000 pounds or more, and they will crush your, your, your crappy, um, if, you, if you don't have uh, a good base, or they will also crush your your culverts if you don't have a good culvert across there too. And then of course I don't see any hydrants because this is probably very rural and probably doesn't have hydrants. So how are we gonna put water on the fire in the first place? You know, they get a lot of bennies for some good things. You know, this is the barn, this is the arena and they are connected. A lot of people like to do that uh, for lots of good reasons. But if you ask your local fire protection engineer, they will tell you 50 feet between structures. Uh, I do like the fact that it's easy to access all the way around this building, so that makes it easier to contain the fire and um, make some effort at rescue. Again, we can learn so much just from looking at these fires, but this is what we see time and time again. You see these open gates here? I am betting that those are the, the, the stalls that those horses were in that the guy got those four horses loose. Um, and that's his little ATV right there, or, or whatever it was. And uh, everything else is gone, but I bet you that's where he got those horses out of. It'll be interesting. One of these days I'll get a hold of them. I usually give people a couple of months to process before I start making phone calls and asking questions. Joanne, this is the one from today. Um, they lost uh, uh, one horse. They saved the other five. This was out in Great Falls, Montana, which I'm sure isn't any warmer than the rest of us. <laughs> And, uh, you know, again, barn is on the fire. It, 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 it starts at 4.30 a.m. Fortunately, some of the, the owner was able to rescue the other five horses. Uh, we don't know any more details um, other than all you see left is anything that is non-combustible. So we will be following up on this. It happens all the time. And it's a great motivator. So what I do is I take a look at here's the same facility as this before, obviously, taken from Google. and uh, Hey, this is great. Plenty of access and a lot of paddocks and things that you could turn horses out into. I'm sure that made it a lot easier. And it looks like these had stalls with choice. But let's take a look over here. How long does it take the fire department to get there? It's 3.9 miles from the volunteer fire department over here to the location. Now it says seven minutes on Google. The fire department might be able to get there a little bit faster. But these days, you know, if your idea is that we are screaming down the road doing 90 miles an hour, most fire trucks don't go over 55. So it's still going to take you four or five minutes. Um, looks like, uh, you know, that's just that's just the way it is. So it will be interesting to follow up on that fire. So now if we go back to NFPA's information, they'll tell you you got five to seven minutes to save anything alive in the facility, which means anything alive cats dogs horses people people being priority that's it you're not going to save anything else you're not going to save your tack you're not going to save the facility you're not going to save anything else you're just going to try to get those animals out uh, and the people out first uh, you just don't have time people think they're going to have time this is one example of what what are you pulling out of the fire what are you going to do with it afterwards do you have a plan for afterwards do you have a veterinarian that you can bring to the location this is a big fire that happened it actually had no flames this is a um, tr for a tractor it's a, a, a block heater that had a problem and it and it and it started smoldering and had all this toxic nasty smoke that came out of the block heater and of course they'd close the building up because they were worried about the horses being too cold and thus the horses all inhaled a lot of that toxic smoke these are all competition horses um, they had to treat 16 of them for smoke inhalation you see that this person is holding on to a big oxygen bottle here and three of the horses had to be taken in for 
um, basically put into ICU because they had uh, significant injuries to their lungs. Didn't happen to anything on the outside. Um, in most facilities that end up with these kinds of things, this is the kind of burns that you get. This is the only horse that um, that she's got pictures of, but uh, they pulled four out of this barn and uh, they managed to, to save four. They lost four others. And I think most of us are looking at that and thinking, I'm never going to be able to show that horse again. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to ride it. And I know that sounds mean, but you know how much money he did survive. They, they dumped a lot of money and effort and time into him and he did survive. And whatever this looks like on the outside, can you imagine what the lungs look like on the inside? It's awful and it requires immediate treatment. I mean, within minutes treatment, which means you've got to have a veterinarian that shows up really quick to your location or you can transport the horse to their location um, to be able to treat this immediately. It's a very important thing to do. So how much money are we willing to dump into a horse that's been in this kind of a situation? And sadly, that's a hard choice to have to make, right? <sighs> this is why barn fires are so depressing. It's just so dang depressing. So let's take a look at some other situations. Uh, large loss fires. This is one that happened out at a racetrack out in California a few years ago. They lost about 50 horses. There was several hundred horses on the facility. They had no plan. Uh, they had people in two languages. Obviously, a lot of people that work at the racetrack speak Spanish. They don't speak English. Um, they're itinerant. They come from other places. Nobody ever works together. They don't require safety meetings. Nobody knows what the plan is. And basically, everybody does whatever they can do. The best, you know, quote, the best that I know how. So this on the left is the facility before the fire. And what I want you to look at really, really close is this was catastrophic fire season. They knew that there was wildfires within a couple of miles of this facility and they didn't change. This is where horse people get themselves in trouble. They didn't change a thing that they were doing. This is straw. Race people love to put straw in their horses' stalls. Straw was actually looked at by Union Carbide in a research project many, many years ago in the 50s, and it was determined that straw, because of its structure and the fact that it's, you know, a lot of oxygen can get to it, burns as fast as if you drop a match in the puddle of gasoline. If you drop a match on the puddle of gasoline, only the surface of the gasoline is burning. It's not the rest of it. This actually burns faster. Did they change a single thing? No. They continued to put straw out there in their horse's stalls. And thus, when a little ember from a a wildfire several miles away started falling into the palm trees and falling into the stalls and catching these on fire. Then people were running around like idiots and trying to get horses out. And there was many heroes that day trying to get horses out. But fundamentally, it could have been changed by, oh, you know, it's catastrophic fire season. Let's put down a different kind of bedding or let's hose our bedding down or do something other than what we've always done. And that's what gets us in trouble, right? So this is the same facility afterwards. You notice that low ceiling so that the heat can't go anywhere. It, the heat and smoke stays right where the horses or heads are and that's where they're breathing it, right? Um, and there's combustibles everywhere. All the metal is left, but the, the combustibles have just flamed out. They, they took every bit of combustible. So what's interesting is after that fire, I sent emails. I made phone calls. I tried to get a hold of anybody and everybody that would listen in that facility. And you know what they did? They built it back the exact same way. They didn't change a thing, folks. And that's our problem in the horse industry. We are traditionalists and we don't understand a dang thing about fire or fire safety or how fires promulgate or prevention. But we continue to do the things that we do in our barns the same way every single time. And that's, I mean, that's on their website. It's, it's just egregious. So we got to start learning from these disasters and stop repeat, repeating the same mistakes. So that's what I do. That's my research. I take a look at all these things. I pull these examples uh, forward and try to get people to say, hey, you know, are we actually doing some planning? Do you hold a safety meeting in your barn? with your employees and with your 
the people that come into your barn, the veterinarians, the body workers, the farriers, the little kids that come to take lessons, the parents that are there with their little kid to take the lessons, um, the trainers, all those folks, do they know what you're going to do, what your plan is if you actually had a barn fire, if you actually had to evacuate? Or are they going to do just like that other place and start running around like, you know, well-intentioned people that don't have a plan and have no ability to communicate, um, screaming fire, 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 and you guys call the lo local fire department and, and they're like, where, where are you? Because they've never met you before. They've never been to your place. They didn't even know you had a barn there. It's just a long driveway. You know, we've got to get better about the education and growth in our understanding as a horse industry to try to get better about this because ha the number of animals that die in these things, it's awful. And then, of course, you know, it would be nice if we had evacuation plans and we'd actually practice the plan and those kind of things. And I guess the problem is we don't think it'll ever happen to us. And that's what we see in all disaster planning is we, it's sort of like going to an Alcoholics Anonymous um, meeting, Joanne. You got to sort of admit there's a problem and then say, what can we do about the problem? So we got to we got to understand that. Right. So where does that really start? It starts with, you know maybe a monthly or a quarterly or at least an annual meeting of all your stakeholders. You know, uh, if you want to bring the fire department, all you got to do is feed them. I mean, if you have a little barbecue with, with, with some hot dogs, your local fire department will show up and they can teach you how to use a fire extinguisher. So how many people actually know how to use a fire extinguisher? A lot of people don't know how to use a fire extinguisher. What about having you know, how to use the other fire safety equipment that you may have in your barn. Do you have smoke detectors? Do you have thermal rate of rise detectors? Do you know how to use them? Do you have a sprinkler system? If you do, there's not a lot of barns that have them, um, but it is possible. It's not, it's not absolutely out of the realm of possibility. And then of course, do you talk about safety rules? And it's amazing how many people don't talk even about safety rules. So I'm going to stop right there for the first break for questions. Do we have some questions, Emily? I can't hear you. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got one here that come in and she asks, would it be easier to evacuate horses if they were familiarized with fire drills, including someone wearing firefighter equipment? Absolutely. So if you can get your local fire department to come out to your facility, you're going to have them teach you how to use a fire extinguisher and any other fire safety equipment. You're going to have them put on their gear and walk around in the barn. Um, before they put their gear on, what I want you guys to do is give them a horse that's very, very easy to handle, okay? And give them a halter in a paddock and tell them, go catch that horse. That's when horse people realize that firefighters aren't horse people and they don't know how to catch a horse. They don't know how to move a horse. So if they're the one that's gonna, that's got to get the horse out of the stall, they probably don't have the tools. So you have to teach them, this is a halter. This is how you properly put it on. This is how you lead a horse without getting run over. Do that first, then have them put their gear on and try to do the same thing and watch what the horses do. And so you're, you're exactly right. That's the best way to do it. Um, the problem is a lot of people aren't willing to invest their time and effort into doing that. And even if you do some of those kinds of things under duress where people are running around and making phone calls and, you know, you're sweating and your body language is telling the horses, hey, there's something really, really wrong and they can probably smell the smoke and they're not dumb. Um, they're not going to be the same calm horse that you're used to in that barn. Rebecca, this is Joe. I've got a question for you too. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, effort of looking at the barn and pointing out flaws to us. And I, a question related to that, could you speak to the use of lithium batteries or some of these ATVs that have had <sighs> spontaneous combustion that are stored oh. or utilized in those facilities? Oh, the biggest thing I can tell you is the fire service is still trying to get a handle on that. We actually went to two one day training events um, with my local fire department and it's scary um, what those things are. Uh, the industry is changing a lot because you can imagine they're, they, they realize it's a problem and they're trying to do something about it. But you've probably heard the things where, you know, if you've got a, 
a phone on fire, you just need to throw it into a pool, right? <laughs> I mean, otherwise, you're not going to be able to put it out. In fact, they've put cars that are burning into pools to try to get them to go out. Um, it is scary. So really what that comes down to is until we know more and we know how to actually handle those lithium fires, I would suggest if it was my barn, I would not put them in the same facility with my horses. And actually, NFPA will tell you, you should have a horse barn and then you should have a tractor shed barn and then you should have a shavings and hay and all your other combustibles in a separate barn. Now, people don't want to do that because of expense and taxes and all the other implications that come with that. And, you know, I live in Georgia. I don't live on, uh, you know, I watched Little, Little House on the Prairie and I remember the whole thing about having a, a string between the barn and the house so that you didn't get lost in the blizzard. And I understand that, but I'm going to tell you that NFPA tells you you should have 50 feet between those structures and you had, should have separate structures because if you put them all together, you can, but you need to put in what's called a firewall, which is a far, it's really difficult to burn through. It takes a long time to burn through. It slows the fire down from the tractor shed side <coughs> to where the horses are. So there's ways to do it, but we got to get smarter about doing it. And that comes down to your local fire department. Your local fire department may not have any expertise on this. I mean, I'm very passionate about barn fires. Other people may not be, but there is some expertise out there. And of course, I can always put you in the, in the right direction. Thank you. What else do we got? And I'm gonna go ahead and, and roll on to the next part. Is that okay? Um, one of our other questions you actually just addressed. So okay. um, I think we're ready to move on. All right, so I tell people, I want you to go into your barns and I want you to try to look with new eyes or take someone that's a firefighter into your barn and let them show you the things that they're looking at. I'm looking at, there's only one way into these stalls. There's no stall door to the outside. That's dangerous for me, it's dangerous for the horses. Uh, long distance between the other end of here and here is, is a long way. Um, I know that doesn't seem like it, but when it's dark and there's smoke and there's, uh, distress and, and fear and horses possibly running through the barns and that kind of stuff, that's a long way to get to safety, which is outside the barn. And I don't see any fire extinguishers. That might be a fire extinguisher right there, um, but one in the middle of the barn aisle isn't doing us much good. We really need it down here by the door where you're coming in, right? And then there's no smoke detection um, or alarm system. And, and that's not impossible to do these days. Uh, a lot of people will tell you they don't like the cheapo smoke detectors. I don't like them either. So you can't spend $4.99 at Walmart. You're going to have to spend some more money. But if you get the right thing, there are rate of rise thermal detectors and other um, more expensive detectors that can be used in these systems. And they'll even go to your cell phone. They'll go through your security system. Um, they can be hardwired to the local fire department to be able to to actually know that you've got a fire because fires often happen in the middle of the night and there's nobody there. Um, you'd be amazed how many barns burn to the ground and nobody even notices. The next day somebody comes to the barn and it's literally burned to the ground. Um, very sad. So you're always balancing your security. You know, we don't want to lose our horses. We don't want somebody to steal our horses, all those kind of things. And I understand that with our fire and life safety. Um, but I will tell you that if you don't have a good detection system and then an alert that lets people know, hey, there's smoke in this barn or there's heat, um, unusual heat in this barn. And if you don't have a response system, which usually means you and your spouse and your kids and your next door neighbor, um, because the local fire department is going to be coming, but they're going to be a little slow. And then a suppression system of some kind, which usually is fire, to, you know, fire extinguishers, um, high pressure hoses, which is hard to do when you live in on a well, and then uh, sprinkler systems, which is um, something that we don't really talk about in the horse uh, world, but it is possible to do. And and what I tell people is, you got to get the horses out because you're going to lose the facility. That it's it's just one of those things. You're you're probably not going to save anything. And so stop worrying about the barn. Stop worrying about your tax. Stop worrying about all the other stuff. Um, you got to get the horses out. You got to get the people out first and get the horses out because fire doesn't care. 
And we, we mentioned response time earlier. I want you guys to ask your local fire department about that. And the fire service, you know, they take a look at when the call is received to the arrival of the first apparatus at the scene, the first engine, not the first, you know, volunteer firefighter in his POV, but the first engine that actually happens, which when he gets there, he doesn't just jump out of the truck and run into the barn. He does an assessment. He does a 360. He makes sure that people are out of the barn. He's going to stop the crazy lady right here from, you know, this is my horse torque and we were doing a, a training, but they're going to stop the crazy lady from going back in and trying to get any of the other animals. So um, that's going to take time. And, and fire just doesn't care. Fire really starts at the moment of fire ignition. You know, there's a lot of smoldering usually in the beginning. And then it continues until the fire is extinguished. And that's and it just doesn't care. And it doesn't care if the fire department even gets there. It doesn't say, oh, the fire department's here. I'm going to slow down. Um, it just grows and grows and grows. And those are pictures from Kim Bryant that lost four horses and got four horses out. But uh, it's just it's amazing how fast it goes. So, SPA 150, I am the technical lead for this committee. And we have been working hard for many, many years. This started back in the 70s. Um, where the insurance companies were losing a lot of racetrack barns and so it started out as racetrack barn code and now it has gone to all animal housing so if you have a zoo or you have a horse barn or you have a pet sitting uh, business or you have a veterinarian clinic any of those things that have animals in them it applies to you and it, it really is a best practice it's how to handle combustibles and flammables and ventilation and overhead structures and compartmentalization, which is all stuff that your local fire department can help you with. But sadly, it goes back to some of their research, which basically says you got to be able to get the animals out in less than five minutes. And I defy you guys that have more than three horses to get all your horses out in less than five minutes. It's really hard to do. And I, I encourage you, go home and try it. We're going to talk about how to do a, a practice here in a little bit. It'll scare you how long it actually takes to do those kind of things. And based on the statistics, we find that the average animal barn is fully involved in less than 15 minutes. It probably was an, a non-survivable space. In other words, you wouldn't survive the toxic smoke at about the five to seven minute mark. And that's why this is so damn depressing, because we try really hard to get this information out to people, but after these kinds of things, people say the same thing. You know, I wish I had known. I wish I had looked into that. And I, and I go, the information's out there. We've been putting this stuff out there for, for 50 years. So we got to get better as an industry doing this. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that, you know, first of all, the fire department's got to find the fire. I, I think they're going to find this one. That's a pretty good marker of where the fire is, right? But the problem is if your fire is in the, hopefully in the smolder stage and it hasn't gotten to flame stages, how is the fire department going to find your address? Uh, especially in horse communities, there's many horse communities where there's lots of uh, look-alike uh, driveways that tend to go up towards this barn. And uh, that's what it looks like in the dark. How are they going to find it in the dark? So that comes down to, do you have a readable, reflective sign that they can see in the dark? If this is what it should look like in the daytime, this is what it should look like at night, so that when I'm in a fire truck driving 45 miles an hour down your road trying to find your driveway, I can see this and turn into the correct driveway. Now, what happens if you have a barn and a house on the same thing? You need a reflective sign that says barn this way, house that way. Or if you have a separate address for the barn, you need to have a separate address for the barn. Okay, so that's really fundamental to even getting the fire department there in the first place. And then, of course, make it accessible. And does the fire department know how to get in? Because people have, you know, all kinds of things. And that, you know, here's one that's recent. This was last fall in, here in Georgia. Um, lost, I think, 26 horses at this uh, riding facility. And, you know, there's before the fire, uh, a nice picture. And this is after the fire. And this is an access point for the fire department. So they made a ventilation access with a big saw to be able to get into the door. Because once you drop that door down, there's no way to get into the barn. And especially if you don't have stall doors to the outside. So they lost everything in that barn. And one of the reasons they lost everything when we talk about accessibility is the fire department's way over here to the left. 
And so the fire department comes down here and they, you know, you give them them the address and they come, woo, wee, woo, wee, woo, and they come down here and they go, oh, I got to turn into this place. So they turn into this place. Um, well, they can see the fire over there, so they might turn this way, which is all a, you know, cul-de-sacs and doesn't access over there. You got to go over here. Oh, we could accidentally go over there. Then we're going to, this is like playing a game. This is ridiculous, right? So have we had our local fire department out to our place, especially if you have a private driveway like this place had? Um, they need to know how to get there. I was a sinner as well. And I show these pictures because it shows that I used to be a sinner. I had this beautiful driveway and all these trees were up and down this whole driveway right here. So I love my trees, but guess what? I called and had the people come out and take all those trees down through that driveway because guess what? When I realized that a fire department with a huge engine can't make it up my driveway to my house, I had to let some trees go. They've got to be able to get there. Do I have a water hydrant? Do I have a small culvert? Uh, I just spent $4,500 on a culvert for my place because the old one was getting ready to go in. Um, you know, how can I make it more accessible? You can see that now it's much easier for a fire department vehicle to go up my driveway. We, we all have our holes. We all, none of us are perfect, including me. Um, over the years, I've just learned a lot of these kinds of things and I'm trying to share it with you guys. So if you don't have a hydrant, how is the fire department going to provide water to fight the fire? Um, they're going to come in and put in what's called a pool or a drop tank, and then they're going to draw water off of it, and then they're going to have another vehicle that's going to bring water and dump it in the dump tank. Do you have enough room to have multiple fire trucks running up and down your driveway and turning around or, um, you know, talk to your local fire department how would they actually fight a fire at your barn where do they need to park can you pre-position do they already know where they need to be and where the the tank would need to be do you have a dry hydrant this is a dry hydrant it's just one example of that in other words you have a pool or you have a pond that's close to the road and uh, they come in and they they can put in a dry hydrant now they're going to want to share it with the, the community so it's not like it's your own per personal private dry hydrant, but uh, do you have that capability? Do you have a pond? Do you mind if somebody comes in here and uses most of the water in your pond? Some people get really pissed off about that. So again, talk to your local fire department about those kind of things. And now I'm gonna take you to the person that took it seriously. This lady right here came to one of my trainings years ago. And after the training, she went home and she was a, a barn manager, and uh, turns out she manages four barns for one lady. And she told her employer that the place is going to burn to the ground, and we haven't done any of the things that we need to do. So they went and spent 500 grand. They upgraded four barns. They put in a pool system that drains water off of the indoor arena that's up on top of the mountain. They put in a pump. They did all these things. And then she called me and she said, hey, would you like to come visit and see what I did? And I said, sure. And I had no idea who she worked for. And uh, so I went and looked and I was walking around and, and I don't know about y'all, but I would sleep right there. I, that That is a hotel as far as I'm concerned. I would put my little bedroll right there and sleep. It was beautiful. They had put in a firewall between the lower floor and the upper floor because their employees live up there. They did training in two languages. They put in a brand new electrical system. They took all the old paint and lacquer and varnish and stuff, which just makes the fire burn faster. And they put in the fire resistant stuff. They put in firewalls between ends of the barn. They built a separate barn for all their hay. They, I mean, they just went on and on and on and on. Um, they put the electrical and conduit. They put in a sprinkler system. They started bringing in only a, a week's worth of hay. Instead of filling this entire end of the barn with hay, they put in a week's worth that they need to use in the barn and they switch it out every single week. They did everything. And I was just amazed. I was like $500,000. And she said, hey, Rebecca, don't worry about it. It's going to pay for itself in five years because our premium dropped so much for Mrs. Mars, as in Jackie Mars Barnes, that she's just so thrilled that she was able to spend 500 grand 
and be able to upgrade all this. We needed to upgrade it anyway. And I, I was just amazed. So it can be done. And it doesn't have to be 500 grand. It doesn't have to be the New York Mounted Police Department. I work with them too. They, you know, this is on the third floor of the Mercedes building. It's right in Manhattan. They did all the right things. They've got the sprinkler system. They only bring in a limited amount of hay. They've got firewalls between each floor. They've put in the right of rise thermal detectors and the alarm systems and all those things. And I know most of us are thinking, there's no way I can spend that kind of money. You don't have to. What you got to do is you got to take a look at what am I doing every single day that gets me in trouble? It's the management problems that get us in trouble. Do we walk by this and there's something that's popped and we don't check it? Uh, do we, the, the, the door is open on this and so we leave it open. The reason for this door is to keep anything that sparks in here in the metal cabinet, not falling onto the floor. Is everything in conduit? Um, you know, when we start seeing problems, do we replace the main electrical? Is there access to your main electrical from the outside of the, of the barn so that you can turn off the electrical and slow the fire down? Um, you know, those are simple things that you can ask your local electrician. If you ask your emergency responders to come and do a walkthrough, um, this is uh, uh, some folks that had a, a fire department come and uh, they didn't understand why they were having a problem with this one circuit. So they brought their thermal imaging camera and you can see that they're looking at one of these and it's hot. You can't tell it by your eyes, but you can certainly tell it by looking at the thermal imaging camera. And guess what? So that's a hot circuit, but guess what else is going on? What is this? That is a mouse nest. If you are a mouse, a little uh, electrical place like that is a great place to build a, your nest. But what that means is you're bringing all these combustibles in here into your electrical system. And that's how fires start, right? So we got to update our electrical. I think anybody can tell that this is not to any kind of code anywhere, except maybe in a third world country, um, certainly not where we live. Um, and then let's take a look at some other things. I mean, things that we look at every single day. What's wrong with this? Well, first of all, those are the cheapo box fans that the company will tell you, please don't buy our fan. They're not, they, our fans have open motor construction. They are not grounded. They are present a serious fire hazard in barns. You know, please don't buy our fans. That's what he's saying, right? But what do we do? We buy these things and then we say, oh, well, we'll just put a little fan up. Your horse is begging you. I want to be outside. I want to have better ventilation. This is a cage. It smells, it's nasty. I'm forced to be in my own feces. And if you don't want to listen to that, at least take a look at this. You know, bad, 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 bad. You know, don't get a cheapo box fan. They don't want you to buy them. And they're in every single barn. And then, of course, there's all these, these innovative ways to try to strap them to the wall. You know, that open motor construction picks up all the dust and finds that's blown around. And even the best barns have dust. And it's going to go in there and it starts fires. Okay. And of course, there's all kinds of other other things that have start fires too, um, extension cords, those kind of things. Uh, here's a a water tank. You know, for whatever reason, this got up against the edge, and the water heater cooked the the plastic of that hundred gallon tank. Uh, I think anybody can tell that this is bad. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to have an imagination or be an electrician to tell that, right? So, what can we do? This is a better quality fan. It still has an open housing on the back, but it's a better quality fan and the chances of it starting a fire are much less. This one is a closed housing fan. It's even better and it's plugged in. I'd prefer that it not be plugged in. I'd prefer that it be up where the ventilation engineers would tell you. This cross ventilation crap is crap. The, the ventilation engineers will tell you the ventilation in a barn should be up above the animals and pushing down whether it's a big ass fan, one of those ones that's up, up ahead, uh, above, or one like this, but a closed motor so that you can't get the crap into the fan. Does the fan still need to be cleaned every year? Of course it does, but stay away from these things and talk to your local fire department. They'll tell you those things are notorious for starting fires. <sighs> okay, does this look like a it looks more like a hotel, doesn't it? It's got marked fire extinguishers. It's got marked exits, all this kind of things. Why don't we have those in barns? 
because we're ag, baby. We don't have to do it because we're agricultural. And so we're going to take, take all these cheap, you know, it gets you in trouble, right? It, it's cheaper. We don't have to have all the permits and all those kind of things. And we don't have to follow all these codes. But guess what? Because of that, we don't mark the exits. That's fine until you get a fire. That's fine until you're down on your knees crawling underneath the smoke and you're looking for where's the exit, right? We don't want to be in that position in our barns, especially if we've got kids in those barns and other people in our barns. And part of the problem in the past, because we're ag, has been that people said, oh, well, it's just a horse barn. No, it's not. That place has got more kids and people in it than the average school, right? I mean, I go in plenty of places that have got tons of kids. And I go, well, you know, they do training once a month. They do a fire, fire um, um, practice at school. But we never do it in our barns because we don't have to because we don't look at it as a business. We don't look at it as an occupancy that has like a church, you know, and that's basically horses or horse church, right? So when we start looking at it as a horse church, that will that will change a lot of things for us. So what you're supposed to do is build a separate facility away from the animal facility for all of your combustibles. Everything here, this will change your perspective. Those of you that put hay in your barns, I want you to understand that a 75 pound bale like that um, is basically the, ex exudes the same amount of BTUs, the, the energy, as a one gallon container of diesel fuel. So if you are willing to put one gallon containers of diesel fuel in your hay mow above your horses, then you keep putting your hay above your horses. It's the same thing. You know, a, a, a thing of diesel fuel doesn't start magically on fire either. Hay barns don't start, hay doesn't start on fire magically either, but it is easier to combust because of its surface area. So what do we do? We look at, do you have secondary fencing? If you come down here, I love this structure. You've got stall doors the outside. I can just run down through here, open the stall door, chase this horse out, shut the door because horses will go back in, shut the door, run down through here, let all these horses out. And then guess what's going to happen? Joanne's horse has been waiting its entire life to kill Emily's horse. They are both bitches. They live next to each other and they hate each other, right? And so when you let them out, that's what people worry about, right? That's why we don't do these trainings, you know, these practices, because we're afraid what's going to happen if we actually let them out. But what I worry about is, yes, they're going to fight and all those kind of things. And if you got a stallion that you cut loose with all the mares, you're going to have babies in 11 months, right? Because horses don't say, oh, my God, we're, we're escaping from a fire. The, the stallion's like, hey, baby. <laughs> but the point being, I also worry about those horses, when you cut them loose, do they run to the road? Are they going to get hit by the fire truck or traffic that's out there in the road that's trying to come help um, when they see the fire if you don't have secondary fencing? So that's why we like some kind of secondary fencing, whether it's a paddock or a pasture or something that's separated from where the horses could run to the road. Because it, it's already bad enough you got a fire. Now you get something hit in the road and, and possibly hurt a person too. And that makes it an even worse tragedy, right? So I don't care how you do it. This is not fancy, uh, but it works, right? So whatever works for you, secondary doors to the outside and small paddocks for choice where the animal can say, hey, I want to be inside, outside. I want to... I want to talk to my buddies or I'm going to go back in and just chill out, right? When you actually do it, what you what you learn, and what I want you guys to learn from this is we do these trainings with fire departments and my poor horses. This is Tornado, one of my horses. And the only time he ever goes in a barn is when we're doing one of these practices. And he has learned, oh my God, every single barn they put me in, they're going to put in fake smoke in and they're going to, quote, burn it. So I need to go to the door, stand there and let the fire department catch me, right? Most horses don't do that. What they do is they turn their butt to the door because, they, you know, Darth Vader just showed up. And I tell the firefighters, if the horse turns his butt to the door, don't open the door because it's too dangerous for you. You're going to get hurt. And so it's it's just, you know, we try to tell people you don't really have time for halters and lead ropes. You got to have a run out plan. They need to be able to open the stall door and send them out because there's so many different <laughs> mouse traps. Have you guys ever gone into somebody's barn and tried to go down and open a stall door to get a horse out and you can't figure out how to get the damn horse out of the stall? It's crazy, right? They have these kinds. I love these. Firefighters can use these really easy if they know what they are. So I tell people, put a piece of reflective tape on them because with a gloved hand, it's really hard to get some of these open like this. 
unclipping this is impossible with your with your gloves on or if you're under duress or stressed um, there's a million different mouse traps and if you don't know how these mouse traps work you're it's going to take it's it's going to take you a while so let's prove it to you these are firefighters that have never been in this barn it is smoked up so that they can't see and they are just trying to figure out how to open the door it took them 12 minutes to get the first horse out of this just terrifying and and this is a fake it, it, they know it's fake it's 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 fake smoke it's just a training thing and it's the reality of it is in under duress it's really hard to do and if you've never done it before it's really hard to do so even if you're a horse person and you quote have been in that barn a million times when the lights go out and there's smoke in there and the horses are really terrified and you're terrified your reaction is going to be very different so what we do is we do a lot of these kinds of trainings with fire departments and we show them how difficult it is to actually catch horses lead horses out and we time it how long does it take to actually get seven horses out it takes nine minutes um, how long does it take to get seven horses out if you just do a run out plan well it turns out it takes two minutes and i'll show you a, an example this is a a gal that's never been in a fire uniform before she put on a fire uniform but she's a horse person so she's actually able to figure this out she goes to the stall door she knows how stall doors work she tries to chase the horse out the horse says uh i don't know but as soon as she walks in there he says i'm out of here and so we're going to let him out the door at the other end again this is a training just to get people to realize how difficult it is now she's going to walk down to the second stall does the same thing she tries to let the horse out and the horse says, I don't know, you look pretty scary. She tries some good things. Just by walking in the stall, the horse says, I'm out of here. <laughs> Again, really difficult if you're not a horse person. So she made it look easy, but the fire department is not gonna make it that easy if they don't practice. So that's why we gotta have people practice. So. AFPA talks a lot about design and having a uh, run out design for these kinds of situations. There's your barn. Do you have some gates at either end of the barn where you can open stall doors, chase them out into an enclosure? Um, if you chase them out this way, are, do you have secondary fencing so that they don't go to the road? Those kinds of things to think about. Um, can you just open or close a few gates and chase horses out? Uh, what they'd really prefer is that you have stall doors to the outside and nobody ever has to go down through the barn because that solves the problem of safety. This is a good example. Why do people say don't let, uh, you know, horses are, are dumb. They'll run right back into a barn. Well, they don't mean to be dumb. They just think of the barn as a place where they get food and they aren't chased by other horses and nobody's riding them or making them do something. So they're like, hey, this is my chill spot, right? And my buddies are in here. This is a good example. This is Tornado, I, I mean Torque, and uh, I have Aunt Ariel, one of my other horses, is in another stall back here. So this is a training. These guys let Torque out of this stall, and he is sort of, you know, it's really dark, and the only reason you can see that is because I've got my flash on, but he's trying to make his way out of the barn. So he's he walks down the bar barn aisle, and when she hears his feet clopping on the pavement, Ariel calls to him. And when she goes, ah, he turns around and comes walking back into the barn. Now, fortunately, he's a very good boy and he's not going to kill a firefighter and run around and like an idiot. Right. But the firefighters, they didn't know this was going to happen. And they were like, wait, didn't we just let this horse out? And I was like, well, you did. But he came back because you chased him out, but you didn't chase him good enough. Right. So. What I'm saying is it's not as easy as you think. Even if he goes outside, he may turn around and come back in, which is really dangerous for firefighters and for the horses themselves. So we gotta have a plan. Uh, this is an example of a good plan. We're actually doing a barn evacuation practice here. This is up at Olds College in Alberta. They had 40 something horses, they're research horses. And so we started, the firefighters started at one end of the barn, opened the stall doors and started working their way back down this way. And they let 42 horses out in about four minutes. It's pretty amazing. Um, but you can tell what the horses were like, yeehaw, nobody ever lets us run out. And I know everybody on this call right now is thinking, 
there is no way I am going to let my valuable horses go running down the barn aisle out into a paddock. But I'll tell you under an actual situation, that's what you have to do. And the problem is we never want to practice for it. So it's really difficult. Uh, some of the things that we do with firefighters in our trainings is we teach them to do things like use a rope around the neck to lead the horses. So you may want to practice with your horses. That would be a great thing for people to practice with their horses, just putting a lead rope around the neck and leading them out with a hay string or a rope or something um, every single day where, for a week so that they get used to that. And that way a firefighter can do that. You can imagine what a horse thinks the first time somebody walks up in this kind of a gear, right? That's crazy. You got to practice, you got to practice, and you got to practice more. And part of that comes down to having a plan, practicing your plan, figuring out what the problems are. Um, we were doing this training and this lady had some some young horses and, and I was amazed. She was more than willing to let us practice even with her baby horses. And they were very good. They did exactly what we wanted them to do, but uh, you could tell they were a little worried. So get with your local fire department whatever you got to do donuts work great for cops but barbecue works great for firefighters have a barbecue and practice your far, barn fire escape plan um talk if you know talk to your your local fire department about walkthroughs uh, what fire hazards do they see it's free nobody from the fire department is going to come and charge you they want you to have them come do these things we call it a pre-plan i do it for every single in my community i do a pre-plan for free for every single business in this in the city of gray georgia every single year once a year it costs them nothing so take advantage of your fire department ask them to come out and do those kind of things and what it really comes down to is having that escape practice so try it time it get two people outside the barn aisle make your fake call fake call to 911 start the timer go get those horses open the stall door try to get them out lead them out whatever you're going to do chase them out um, shut the door behind them and then once you've got all that done shut the doors to the barn so that nobody goes into the barn right <sighs> it'll take you longer than you think if it doesn't take you longer than you think, or you already have one, get a hold of me. Why do I tell you all these things? I want you guys desperately to learn from this because when I make phone calls to people after they have fires, I'm usually talking to people that have lost everything. They've lost their animals. Sometimes they've lost a person. Uh, they've lost everything for their business. It's, it's awful. And they want you to understand that it can be done better. These people lost their entire barn, but they got all 20 horses out. Why? Because they had a run out plan. They chased them out. They closed the doors. They didn't have secondary fencing. So some of the horses went to the neighbors and down the road, but at least they got them out of the barn from this thing. This is another example. We had 37 horses in this. This is a train team that we worked with up in Canada um, with Equine Guelph and they were able to save 32 horses and only five died they had firefighters in scba those tanks that they breathe funny removing the horses but because they'd done it and they had an organized response and they'd been to this property before and they knew their way around and they were trained they were able to get that out so you know it's just amazing that it actually works we want to give you guys the tools that actually work so the last thing I want to talk about is this is what everybody always asks. You know, what what would your perfect barn look like, Rebecca, if you <laughs> were going to actually build a barn? Um, I would invest in more property and no barn. But anyway, buy more property, less barn. OK, it's not about the barn. Your horses want to be outside. But what you really want to do is make sure you upgrade your electrical. If you have been in your barn for more than 10 years, you need to get an electrical inspection. You're looking for, you know, the mice eaten anything uh, do you need lightning protectors do you have all your appliances plugged in correctly do you have an overloaded uh, you know circuit those kinds of things we use electrical for everything I go in barns these days I was just at a barn the other day they have infrared heaters they have spas and saunas for horses all that stuff is based on electrical power so if you are still using you know put it plugging all that stuff into a barn that hasn't had an electrical inspection in 30 years you are wrong <laughs> i don't I, I don't need to be an electrical inspector or an electrician to tell you you are wrong you got to do something about that so 
take a look at if you've got to have everything together. If you just got to have the stall doors next to the tractors and equipment, which is next to your living and storage areas, then you need to talk to someone about how do you install fire doors and firewalls um, to make that safer, slow the fire down in one area so that you have time to get the animals out of the other areas. Um, and then of course, don't do dumb things with your, you know, those kind of things. Um, access to the interior and the exterior aisle. I can't tell you how important that is. And I know people say, well, if I have outside doors, you know, they get stuck in the mud, they, the, the snow gets in them, they, all these things. And I go, I know, I know it's awful, but I'm going to tell you that that is the best way to get the horses out is to have access to the stall outside wall. Um, no combustible storage in the barn, you know, except that what you're using. Uh, in general, what NFPA would tell you is that the entire barn should be non-combustible materials. But horse people don't want to do that. They don't want, they want to use wood. They want to look, look, use something that looks traditional, right? But wood is absolutely combustible. So there you go. There's where tradition gets us in trouble. Facility run out, planned and practiced. Um, evacuation plan for other disasters while you're at it. How do you get, you know, not only out of the barn, but also off the property. And then of course, you know, how do you get large vehicles like fire trucks up and down your driveway, you know, 14 feet high, 12 feet wide. That's part one for how we would like that. Um, you know, there's my horses at home enjoying being outside. Anyway, uh, other perfect things for their barn, no obstacles. All that crap that's in your aisleway for, you know, blankies and tack boxes and all those things, it makes it really difficult and dangerous for fire department personnel to go in there under those, those situations. And guess what? They won't. If they realize there's a lot of obstacles and you've turned your barn into a maze, they are not going to, no safety officer in his right mind is going to send anybody into a barn like that. Um, preferably, you shouldn't have a barn that's larger than 5,000 square feet. If you need a 50,000 square foot barn, then what you should do is build 10 separate barns and at least 50 feet between them. And I know a lot of horse people are like, you're ridiculous, Rebecca, there's no way. And I go, well, if you've got a, if you've got 10 5,000 square foot barns and one burns, you only lost the animals that are in that barn. You didn't lose them all. And you didn't lose your, all your, all your uh, other things too, right? Use gates and hinges and doors that actually work. You can't imagine how many times in these fires uh, the fire department can't get in the door. There's locks, there's crappy latches, things that don't work, um, mazes that, that lead to blind, blind ends, those kind of things. Um, no more than 50 feet for an exit. That is a code rule. You need to be able to be within 50 feet of an exit, which is the other reason they want it 5,000 square feet or less. High ceilings are great. It allows better ventilation for animals, um, and it also allows better individual stall ventilation. Uh, take a look at the, getting those downward ventilation fans. There's a reason these big barns want those big ass fans and the other um, nice fans that push the stuff down. Take a look at getting smoke flame, carbon monoxide, razor rise thermal detectors connected to an alarm system in your barn. I'm not saying it's 15 bucks. It's not. It's going to be expensive. But guess what? How much did you spend on your on your place? And how much are you willing to uh, lose? You know, people always tell me, oh, this is my heart horse. And I'm looking around their barn and I'm like, I wouldn't put my horse in here for even one night. And, you know, you're telling me this is your heart horse. <laughs> you and I have a different priority system. I can tell you that. Anyway, fire extinguishers throughout the barn. If you have these crappy five pound fire extinguishers, I'm going to tell you, just scare yourself to death. Go outside, take that five pound fire extinguisher and extinct, try to put out a, a 50 pound bale of hay. You can't do it. A five pound fire extinguisher will not do it. In fact, you really shouldn't do it without a hose around because as soon as you crank that bale up, it's going to start a fire and it may, may start a fire in a wildland fire, right? So a 20 pound or a 10 pound fire extinguisher, they're not 20 bucks at Walmart. They're more expensive. I tell people, you really ought to go down to the commercial folks that sell fire extinguishers to commercial businesses. And they usually, you know, they, they'll have a, a thing where they come around every, every month or once a year and check your fire extinguishers and make sure they're still good, right? And then of course, learning to use that fire extinguisher. And if you have high risk areas, if you have dryers and washers and, 
uh, a whole bunch of uh, electrical appliances, or if you are using propane appliances, those kind of things, you really need to make sure that those areas in particular are protected with some kind of a detection system. Um, you may need to put in a, a firewall around that area just so that if something happens in that room, it stops it before it gets to where the horses are. And of course, uh, if you have insurance, I encourage you to read the fine print, which means get your insurance company to come walk through your barn ahead of time. If you learn nothing else, the people that I talk to after these large loss fires with barns, they will tell me all the time, man, I insured this place for a million dollars. And, you know, when the payout came, it was like a quarter million. And I'm like, wow, that's awful. And they're like, yeah, I mean, I thought I was going to get replacement cost and I didn't get replacement cost. Why? Because I didn't read the fine print or I didn't, you know, there was, there's things in those you know, insurance company. I hope nobody on here is a, is an insurance person, but they're going to, I talk to insurance people and they tell me, you know, we're in the business to make money. So we're perfectly willing to pay out if you have done your homework, but if you didn't read the fine print and you haven't looked at your insurance um, thing in 15 years, things change. So you really need to sit down with your insurance company, update your insurance, do a walkthrough with them and your local fire department, have them tell you where the problems are. And I always tell people, you know, I'm more than willing, if you send me pictures, you know, I just tell them don't get butt hurt if, if I tell you what my opinion is, but send me pictures. I will tell you what those problems are. That's my little girl with her tongue taking a bath in the pond. Anyway, thank you to my demonstrators. Thank you to my colleagues. I've got a couple of colleagues on here tonight, I see. And that's Ariel being, quote, led out of a emergency barn fire. That's a training situation. And she looks really cute and all those things. That's what people think it's going to look like. That's not what it looks like. Uh, under real duress, it does not look like that. But here's my email. There's my cell phone. If you guys have questions or comments or if you want to send me pictures of your barn, um, and the things that you have, I, I will help you. I help people all the time. Um, and uh, I just want to make things better for, for horses. And I want to make it better for the people. Every single horse that's out there is connected to a person somewhere. And most of us love horses. And we want to see things be better. And I desperately want to make things better for mm -hmm. horses and the way we build barns. That's it. Rebecca, thank you. I'm blown away with all the material. And uh, one question I have for you is, do you have a published checklist we could get our hands on? I just love I the do. fact about the walkthrough that people could use the paper and do all yes. of these assessments. So what you need to do is remind me in an email tomorrow and I will okay. send you that checklist. Equine Guelph up in um, Guelph, Canada. We do a lot of work together and my brain doesn't work that way, but they have sat down with me and Michelle Staples and a couple other people, and they have made checklists for facility safety, for barn fire safety, to be able to do a walkthrough. And of course, that would be the best way to do it is have that checklist and have the fire department person there with you and walk through and just read the checklist off and have them, they would learn something and you would learn something too. I love that. Thank you very much. But you Emily, do we have some questions <laughs> we haven't answered too? I should ask you that before we close out here. Yeah. Um, it looks like most of the questions she really touched on. Um, I I had a, per a question myself. Um, so you touched on the fans. Yep. Um, my other big concern always every year is the heated water buckets. Yes. And Thanks. What What are your thoughts on those? Well, that, you know, that's really been with the cold across the whole country right now. I've been watching a lot of things and what people are trying to do without using electrical. But it basically comes down to it. you got to have electrical for most of the situations because your, your horse is going to die if he doesn't drink water, right? So, and everybody knows that. And there's been a lot of research from AAAP and some of the veterinarians out there about that horses really prefer water that's not just right above freezing. They actually like it in the 40 to 45 degree range. So how can we do that? We can only do that by either replacing the water every single day um, or adding hot water or having a heater in it. So that comes down to, is the heater um, new, um, doesn't 
hasn't been stomped, ripped, pulled, jerked, twisted, etc. Um, those kind of things that, that, that interfere with the electrical cord. Is it plugged into a ground fault indicating circuit? Um, your electrician should know how to do that. Um, that will prevent the animals getting shocked um, as well as you getting shocked if there is a problem, but will also prevent things like fires if there is a short somewhere in that system. They are a pain in the butt sometimes, you know, some of them are very touchy and that's why people don't like them because, you know, uh, that's the kind of thing that your hair dryer should be in your house or at the motel. And of course, you know, if there's a little bit of dust in the air or there's a little bit of, of humidity, sometimes those things will trip, but I would rather have them trip than to get electrocuted or have a horse electrocuted or when you're talking about electricity and water, it's really dangerous. And then of course, causing um, the problems with fires and those kind of things. And I've got several pictures of buckets and 100 gallon tanks and those kind of things that have burned, burned to the ground. Fortunately, they caught it. Um, but you're exactly right. Anytime you have electrical and water close to each other and then you add in a horse, you know that that's a, a recipe for disaster. Right. Stay away from the cheap crap online. <laughs> you know, go yeah. to a store, take a look at what you're actually getting. Um, I know that's easy for me to say because some places don't have really good farm stores um, or get a recommendation from an electrician. But generally, if it's UL listed, um, that's going to help a lot. Uh, that's just an organization that tries to help with, with those kind of things. And just stay away from some of the, if it's, if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. And just check it. You know, I, I mean, if, if I had a barn and I had any concerns, I would toss that one out and get another one for next year. I mean, it's cheap insurance, right? Yeah, I, I personally replace mine about every two years, whether they there you go. need it or exactly. not. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's, you know, that comes down to horses are expensive. They are not cheap. It amazes me how many people try to make horses be cheap. And I go, just admit your sin. You love them. It costs money. I just gave this lecture to my parents last week. You know, they've got a 29-year-old horse they've had for, for 24 years. And they're like, oh, man, you know that? Now that he's 29, that equine senior, that's pretty expensive. And I'm like, yep, it is. And that's what you make money for or you used to make money for. And that's that's the price of price of love and horses, right? Yeah, right. Um, you touched on alarm systems. Um, could you maybe go a little bit deeper into sure. that? Sure. Okay. Alarm systems means you really need to get a quote from a certified person that does that for a business, they need to come out and get a quote and they will walk around your facility and they will figure out all the places that are where, first of all, where the, the, the incendiary situation may, uh, where you may have a, a smolder or an, a flame actually occur, which is usually wherever the electrical things are. Uh, some people have taken it to the nth degree. They just don't have anything electrical in the barn unless they're in the barn. And that's probably a pretty good idea. Um, for most places, that may or may not be practical. Uh, some places have a main switch. And as they walk out the barn in the evening, they just hit the switch and turn it off so that there's nothing in the barn that has electrical on. Um, you know, that, that sounds a little crazy to some people. To other people, it sounds like it's perfectly intelligent. Um, so alarm systems can, they run the gamut. They can be really, really simple. Uh, things like carbon monoxide alarms, things like read of rise thermal alarms that you put up above where your hay is. Maybe your hay is in a separate building. So you can, can literally protect that building without having to worry about the barn. Um, uh, maybe you have a tractor shed or, you know, you put a Polaris or something into a portion. That's where I would put a sensor so that it can find out if, you know, if you have things like um, block heaters and things like that, you probably need to take a look at that. Um, those would be areas where the the expert would know these are areas that, that can be impacted. We need to put a sensor for this kind of sensor works better than others. The problem with the cheapos from from um, Walmart and, and stuff is that they go off with a little bit of dust. And it's very frustrating because next thing you know, you've got 
it's going off all the time or the battery goes bad or it gets irritating because it's going off all the time and people rip them out. So it's not that you can't use a smoke detector, it's that you can't use cheap ones. You have to have the stuff that's appropriate. And that means you've got to have somebody that knows what they're talking about to come out and, and give you a quote on that. When you start talking about sprinkler systems and, and those kind of things, that gets into um, quite a bit of money, particularly if you're doing a retrofit. You know, that's what Mrs. Mars did. She retrofitted four barns <laughs> and her antebellum house from the 1700s and all those things. And that's why it cost her 500 grand. But if you are doing new construction, that's when we really wanna get a hold of you is, hey, I'm getting ready to build a barn. That's when you wanna put in your sprinkler system because it's so much cheaper if it's already part of the barn uh, ahead of time. And even if you live in the cold country, there are ways around the uh, frozen water problem. Um, people have been doing it in, in warehouses for, for a long time. And there's a lot of expertise. Uh, technology has improved a lot over the years. It really comes down to, you know, how much you're willing to spend uh, and are you willing to share the cost? Um, I sometimes have people that, you know, are boarders in barns and they say, their question usually is, well, how can I motivate my, the owner of my barn uh, where my horse is now that I'm aware of these problems, how can I motivate the owner? And I tell them, well, um, maybe you can get all the boarders in the barn to get serious about it and they contribute towards a carbon monoxide alarm in the, you know, wherever your electrical stuff is. Maybe you all get together and contribute to a, a uh, rate of rise thermal detector that's in the area that has the electrical and or combustibles in it, um, those kind of things. Um, you know, these days with the technologies we have, the, the detector can send a note to your phone. It can send a note to the fire department. It can send, you know, it can make you aware of it. Um, but you have to, you know, at that point you're aware of it, but what are you going to do now? So now you're going to run out to the barn in your underwear and do what? You know, get horses out, um, get, you know, that's, that's the real reality of it is thinking through how would you do it if it happened right now? You know, it takes me two minutes to get out my door and get to my barn. Um, that's two minutes of my five right there. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And when you Thank practice you, it, when you practice it, um, you'll be scared and then get a hold of me and tell me what you did. And I'll give you some tips on how you could maybe do it a little bit better and we'll shorten the time so that it makes it more realistic. But you can see that, you know, even if you had the, you know, if somebody detects the fire in your barn and you're not even there, if they've been through a safety meeting and you've taught them how to do those things, they can enact a plan and start removing horses before, you know, before having to call you or, hey, there's a fire in your barn. <laughs> I mean, I want people to be able to have agency, do something. Don't just stand around. I went to, uh, years ago, we were doing a training at a facility in uh, Virginia and we started a fake fire in the barn. And we had students walking by and no one called 911. They didn't know what we were doing. We started a fake fire. It didn't smell like smoke, but it looked like smoke. We were, smoke was coming out the top of the barn and no one called 911, which tells me it's like CPR, you know, where people are like, oh, well, somebody will help. Well, it needs to be you. <laughs> You're part of the, right? And that's what that safety meeting is about is whoever comes into your barn on a regular basis needs to have agency and realize, hey, if there's a fire, you think there's really a fire, you need to do something, start something, call 911 to say fire, 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 get people moving to do something, not just stand there. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Very powerful information. And it, it, I'm just struck by the fact that these tools will really save lives. And I'm so grateful for you for bringing this content forward this evening. I've seen a couple of comments too about how sobering and important this is and to engage you know, architects and, and other individuals in this conversation so we don't keep doing the same things again and again and get the same results. So um, Absolutely. And if you, if you are really interested, if you know an architect that's interested in this kind of thing, um, you can refer them mm -hmm. to NFPA 150. It's free to read online for anyone. Um, they can they can go there and read it for free. 
Uh, yes, it's a code, so it's got a lot of gobbledygook for, but, but the people that do architecture and design, they're used to reading some of that code stuff. So they're, they're, it, it may be in, in imposing to you, but it's not going to be imposing to them. And I would love it because when I go to some of these conferences and I meet with designers of horse barns um, and I ask them, hey, are you familiar with NFPA 150? And they go, huh? And I'm like, we got so much to do. We got so, so far to come. Right, oh. right. Well, well, I'm gonna wrap this up. And again, I, I, I'm so grateful for what you've done, Rebecca. And I, I, we've got homework. And I think all of us that have been listening tonight are gonna be highly motivated to ensure the safety of our loved ones and our, our, our farm animals and, and what have you. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank the um, group that attended this evening, and I want to remind all that we recorded this, and it's going to be up on the Fauna site, uh, www.fauna.com, and it's under webinars, there's an icon on the right of the homepage, and you can click on that, and you'll be able to, to listen into Rebecca's uh, barn safety webinar. She also has the trailer safety up there, and if you haven't gotten to that one, don't miss that. That one is equally as sobering and she gave us tools to uh, ensure the safety of our horses and, and people out on the roadways. Um, if you have additional questions, please uh, submit them to fauna at fauna.com and we'll get them to Rebecca for a response. So um, you might think of things after the fact and uh, we'll still have opportunities to run it by her. And she's welcomed you and invited you to send information for questions or for her to review as well. So we're, we're grateful for that kind of consultation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do encourage the audience and others to um, look for additional webinars that are coming up in the near future. We have uh, a couple under construction that will be posted in the future. And again, thanks to all. And I wish you a great night and be safe out there and give those lovely four legged critters hugs and a safe place to live. Thank you all. Thank you guys for having me. Thank Appreciate you. you. Good night.